This is the first of three videos aimed at introducing non-health science librarians and library staff to evidence-based practice in healthcare. This first video is an overview of what evidence-based practice is and why librarians are a really important part of the process. Yes, I want to cover a lot, but I know this is doable. Much of what we'll be focusing on will build on skills you already have, like focusing ill-formed research questions and searching in databases. We're just going to put an evidence-based practice spin on it. I want you to walk away with more skills and knowledge, for sure, but my number one goal is to increase your comfort level when helping students or faculty with health sciences questions. And look, this hedgehog is cheering you on. For my Idaho State University Library colleagues, this instruction is going to be divided into a short series of videos and a longer in-person class. I want to get some of the background information to you via the videos before we start working through examples face-to-face. -face. Before we get started, let's talk about terminology for a second. First, you're going to hear me refer to evidence-based practice as EBP, as it's much easier to say. Also, any field can engage in evidence-based practice. There's even a journal dedicated to evidence-based practice librarianship. When I use the phrase, I'm specifically referring to EBP in a health context. A more specific term is evidence-based medicine, but I prefer practice as it includes all the other health sciences fields as well. There are many different ways to describe EBP, but it boils down to taking the highest quality research evidence, combining it with a provider's knowledge and experience, and then taking a patient's preferences into account. Evidence-based practice is also referred to as a three-legged stool because if you take one of the legs away, the whole thing collapses. All three concepts must be present for it to truly be evidence-based practice. You may have a great research study which says a particular treatment is very effective, but unless the patient will comply, it's completely useless. This movement initially started just over 40 years ago when some healthcare providers and epidemiologists started promoting the idea that healthcare decisions should be based on high quality scientific evidence. One of the outputs of this change was the creation of the Cochrane Collaboration, which gathered experts together to search for, appraise, and analyze research studies in order to make conclusions based on the best existing evidence. When I describe evidence-based practice or medicine to those who are unfamiliar with the practice, I usually get a response along the lines of, wait, medicine hasn't always been based on high quality research? Well, no. And in many cases, it still isn't. Healthcare has largely been practiced by the way the provider is taught and then the traditions and methods that they use throughout their career. Sometimes this is just fine, but other times it means that changes in evidence are not implemented or completely ignored. At first, providers were very hostile to this idea, as they considered it a slight to their clinical expertise, and some still feel this way. But it has reached a point where almost all healthcare fields have to incorporate evidence-based practice, which is why more and more students are coming to us with questions about the process. There are a lot of different approaches to the EBP process, anywhere from four to seven steps. I like this one, which has just six steps and isn't overly complicated. In the classes I teach, I focus on the first three steps, but we're just going to look at the first two. I don't want to overwhelm you. Plus, these are things we do already. As librarians, we've been helping students and faculty ask well-defined research questions since forever. And of course, searching resources is a huge part of what we do. My goal is just to put a healthcare spin on your existing knowledge. The full process includes appraising evidence to determine its value, integrating changes into the healthcare environment, evaluating the outcomes, sharing the knowledge, and then starting all over again. In an ideal situation, evidence-based practice leads to good things because providers and healthcare organizations are implementing practices that have been proven to be effective. This can lead to better care, improved outcomes, and lower costs. While lifelong learning isn't usually a stated goal of EBP, the hope is that once providers learn to ask good research questions, can search for information and evaluate what they find, they will be able to do this throughout their career. So why do I think it's important for even non-health science librarians to learn the basics of evidence-based medicine? First of all, we are natural searchers. We know how to build awesome searches, work in databases, and manage results. And even if you don't have a health sciences background, you can do these things. 
Also, more and more students are required to take EBP courses or do evidence-based practice projects. Their instructors are not librarians, and they rarely have the level of knowledge that we do when it comes to using the library's resources. This can lead to confused and frustrated students coming to us for help. Also, it's kind of selfish on my part. We have a lot of health science programs and students here at ISU, but there's only one health sciences librarian, me. I'd love to get you all comfortable with the basics of evidence-based practice so you can answer these types of questions too.